You know, I see two of my commissioners here, so in front of them, I first want to say that the best vote that I have made since I was a commissioner for the Port of Houston was the appointment of the executive De director, Roger Gunther. I want to be sure they understand that. I think they feel the same way I do. Roger was named the executive director of the Port of Houston Authority on January 2014. With 27 years of experience at the port, Gunther brings uh, operational leadership and a proven track record to the position. He previously served as deputy executive director of operations and was responsible for all containers and break book cargo operations. He actually designed the port for our pads. That was one of his jobs at that point in time. He now has many. He wears so many hats, we don't know which one he's got sometimes at our meetings. But he does such a wonderful job with all of them. He's a graduate of Texas A&M. I went to the University of Texas. I've kind of felt bad about this sometimes introducing Roger. But yesterday, I took my granddaughter and entered her in Texas A&M. So I now have 100% more respect for A&M than I've ever had in my life. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Texas A&M University and has an MBA in International Trade and Finance from the University of St. Thomas. He's on several different committees, the Tech Texas Freight Advisory Committee and the Port of Authority uh, Advisory Committee and is a member of the Board of, of Visitors of Texas A&M University and at Galveston, Texas A&M. However, he did not meet me when I went there yesterday. I was looking for him to greet me. He grew up close to Houston Ship Channel, spent his life basically in Baytown, Texas. He now is a resident with his wife and his children in Pearland, and it is, like I said, an indeed honor for me to have the privilege to introduce our director to you, Roger Gunther. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Commissioner Meese, for those kind words. I, I guess now I better not screw this up. But, uh, and welcome to the Aggie family. Glad you finally got there. So uh, thanks for letting us be here today. Thanks for, uh, it, it's great. We're proud to be the, uh, a sponsor for this event, one that uh, continues to grow a day and a half of uh, tremendous exchange of ideas and and things relevant to our industry and, and the outlook from the port I can tell you is is looking very good going forward and we're excited about the opportunities for ahead that are ahead for all of us uh, I think there's success very much in front of us we have the uh, challenges that we're going to need to overcome together but also exploit some of the opportunities as stakeholders of this great waterway and port. Now, following the majority of my career that I spent down in the trenches of the container terminals, you know, kind of the X and O's, looking at moving boxes and efficiencies of the container terminal and trying to keep freight moving, uh, as Roy said, uh, uh, Two and a half years ago, I was fortunate and quite frankly blessed to be put in a position as the executive director of the, of, of the Port of Houston. But when I got this job, I, I knew there was a job description, but I quickly realized that there was no instruction manual that came with this. So I had to get prepared, but luckily for me, I've had great instructors. And it starts with our commission. Uh, uh, you met Commissioner Meese, Commissioner Don Carlos, and Commissioner Kennedy, thank you. Uh, they're both here with us today. Uh, but they provide the guidance and the selfless service, volunteering, and, and setting the course for the port. And 
Uh, we appreciate that as a staff, so thank you very much. But also instructors that I have, our employees are an amazing group of people. They're committed, they have bought into our strategic plan and uh, are committed to our vision of being America's distribution hub for the next generation. So I learned from them, they have been excellent support and instructors for us and for me, and because of them, we are ready for bigger and better things to come. And to all of you, you know, this has been a journey that we're on, and all of you in some shape or form have given me guidance and instruction and, uh, you know, good words of wisdom and feedback to help us achieve our mission for the greater good of the port. So Chad asked me to give some remarks, and I'm trying to figure out how much sponsorship we have to give so I don't have to speak anymore, but I hadn't figured that out yet. But we were sitting around one day probably with our maroon colored sunglasses and drinking some maroon Kool-Aid and talking about how good the Aggies are going to be this year. And uh, so I just started thinking about what this audience want, may want to hear, and the more I thought about it, I get asked a lot of questions, and maybe I should just share those. What are the things that I get asked all the time about the port? So the first question is easy. How's business? And I got to tell you, the business at the port is really, really good. Uh, our container business is solid. It continues to grow. We topped the 2 million TEU mark in 2015, and we are on pace to surpass that in 2016 with continued growth. Uh, and on the uh, break bulk side, the turning basin, the general cargo, after several record-breaking years in tonnage, there's been a downturn, primarily due to steel, import steel, uh, due to the downturn and the softening of the oil and gas market, but we know all that will come back. It's always been cyclical. But overall, our facilities are uh, doing very well, and we're just a part of the greater Port of Houston. We're about 20% of the tonnage for the overall port. And uh, all of us in the whole industry is critical uh, to the, econ uh, the economic and being an economic engine for our state, uh, not only our region, but also the U.S. Uh, Mayor Isabel mentioned earlier the $265 billion in economic impact that our channel and our port uh, contributes to the state of Texas alone. 16% of the GDP of the state of Texas is generated from our port region. So another question that has been prevailing for many years now, two questions actually, and the first one is, when is the Panama Canal expansion gonna be finished? And thank goodness, we don't have to answer that question anymore. The other question is, what will be the impact? But the Panama Canal expansion did open about a month and a half ago, and the first large uh, Neo Panamax container ship sailed through the new locks uh, and very successfully. And uh, although the impact to Houston is to be determined, I believe we are in a significant position for growth to capture a lot of new business coming through the canal, not only on the container side, but you see a, 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 break, a bulk ship in there, uh, you know, the oil and gas, all of those, I believe Houston is in a great position. Our business through the canal is the fastest growing trade lane that we have and has been for the last several years. We, ha we now have three weekly container ships, container services coming into Houston. It's about 31% of our import business, about 22% of our overall container business. And if you'll recall, 10 or 12 years ago, that was zero. All of the cargo was coming through the West Coast and railed into Houston. So with the ability for this canal to handle larger ships, more containers per vessel, lowering the unit cost of these containers, we think we're well positioned for uh, continued growth, continued efficiencies for these uh, containerized cargo to come in through our port. The other thing is the population continues to grow, which fastest growing region in the nation, fastest growing population uh, in the country, 
And uh, this is driving a tremendous demand for a lot of retail good, import of uh, things that you buy at your big box retailer. So from that side, both import and export, we're in good position. So the next question that we're probably, most of us are familiar with, is I get asked, what are you gonna do with all this resin business? We know it's coming, we've been preparing for it. And I gotta tell you today, before any new of these facilities come online, they're gonna man man manufacture uh, increased tonnages of synthetic resins. Already about one third of our export containerized cargo has some type of plastic resin in it. One third of our export business is dependent on plastic resins. Obviously this uh, is gonna continue to grow and uh, with uh, new facilities online, these are gonna be produced and shipped all around the world. Houston already dominates the country in the export of plastic resin. And we need to keep this economic value to the region of shipping that cargo through our ports. We need to keep it here. This pie is getting bigger and we wanna keep our piece of the pie, percentage of the pie, or even more as it continues to grow. And we have to be ready, and I believe we are ready from a facility standpoint. And again, keep that business growing through our port efficiently, and most importantly, safely. So we've planned for this, spending hundreds of millions of dollars at our facilities, uh, making sure that we have the capacity to handle the, the, the larger ships and the volume that's coming. We purchased new cranes. Uh, at Barber Scott, uh, received those in May of last year, four new cranes. We've got seven new cranes on order, three more for Barber Scott and four for Bayport. We continue the redevelopment of Barber Scott. Barber Scott, don't look now, is 40 years old come next year. We're having to retool that facility to handle these larger ships, so a lot of investment continues to go in those facilities. In our Bayport, Terminal, we continue to build it out as well. We've built out about half of it. We continue to make those investments to make sure that we're ready for the future. And we're making a lot of marketing effort and making investments, partnering with others to diversify our business. We are looking to make sure that we capture some of the uh, cold, uh, fresh fruits and frozen uh, that are imported and the frozen beefs and chickens that can be exported through our region. So those are just some of the things that we're doing at the port to increase our ability and handle new volume that's, uh, that wants to come to Houston. But the main thing I want to talk about is I get asked all the time, what keeps you up at night? And there's a lot of things that keep me up at night. Number one is a 16-year-old daughter that just started driving this summer, and I moved my son off to college again. And, uh, but from a business standpoint, there's, there's a, a few things that keep me up at night, and we have to take care of them. And it's not what we're doing at the port, at our facilities, to take care of this demand. Sure. There's a lot of invest, investment to be made, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. And funding for that is also always gonna be a challenge. The things that we fund that aren't just for our terminals, the things that are associated with dredge disposal and those things that we're really not compensated for, but hey, that's our job and we're gonna figure out a way to do it. But we have worked diligently to ensure that our container terminals remain efficient and they're not congested, which is a lot more than a lot of ports around this country can say. So we have stayed ahead of that to make sure that we don't get into the situation where we're congested. But the efficient port is far more than just our terminals and our facilities up and down the channel. We gotta address the water side, part of the supply chain, taking care of, it, taking care of this busiest waterway in the nation. There's the saying, and it's true, if you don't have a channel, you don't have a port. Every company in this room, every person that works in this industry in our channel is dependent on this one single asset that determines our con continued success, and that is the health 
and prosperity of the Houston Ship Channel. We've got to take care of it. The Port Authority has our government role and works closely with the Army Corps of Engineers to make sure that the, we're the focal point and we take care of the maintenance and the future improvement needs that lie ahead of us. Our channel is going to continue to get bigger. The ships are going to get bigger. More business. Private facilities are already making plans for increased uh, facilities up and down the channel. So we have to continue to push for federal support to fund these projects and make sure that our entrance into our port is secure. Just to put the funding in perspective, we ran some numbers and on average over the last five years, federal dollars that go into our roads and highways in Texas are about $4.2 billion a year. And that's a good thing. We're, we're, we're happy to get federal dollars for our roadways. But the disparity there and the needs that aren't being addressed, you can see on average over the last five years, $120 million for all the ports in Texas, including the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. I can tell you just from the Port of Houston standpoint and Houston Ship Channel, we've been getting roughly $35, $40 million. It takes at least 50 to properly maintain it, but we've got a backlog of 80 or 90 million dollars already that hadn't been done and we're falling behind and we need to keep pushing for that support. But we're fortunate that we were given the opportunity by Congress in the last word of bill where we were selected to undergo a mega navigational study for our Houston Ship Channel. We're excited about that. It's a 10 million dollar study which we're uh, co-sponsors which means we're paying half, splitting it with the core. And uh, it's going to consider a no number of things to make sure that, that our channel is in position for the future. It's going to consider uh, bend easings like into uh, our Bayport and, and Barber's Cut channels. We'll study the deepening, which is something that a lot of you in this room are, are really challenged with, deepening the channel up beyond where it currently is uh, 45 feet all the way to the Bellway Bridge, going further 45 feet up the Houston Ship Channel, widening the Bay Reach, making for safer navigational to make sure we don't have any collisions uh, in our bay and uh, as the ships get bigger and wider and uh, quite frankly more, more uh, ships entering our channel. And we're also going to look at more upper bay anchorages, places where ships that move around in the port don't have to go all the way out to the sea buoy just to come back to go to another terminal. So all of this will be included and all of our stakeholders uh, in the Houston Ship Channel are going to be included in this study to make sure that we get this thing right. We get, we get a, one chance to do it right and we're going to work quickly over the next couple of years to make sure that the Corps understands our need. And we're almost complete with one of the improvements uh, that, we, that we funded, the Barber's Cut and Bayport Channel. The Barber's Cut Channel has deep, been deepened and widened, and the Bayport Channel will be complete later this year. And uh, we'll be addressing the Bayport Flare next, a project that makes for a better turn into Bayport, but it also straightens out uh, one, uh, an area you can see on the right hand on, on, on the on the right hand side going in that makes it a safer navigational uh, uh, flow for the Houston Ship Channel in general. The, the win-win on this is we were able to use the clay to create these bend easings because we had the need to build levees for marshes out in the bay. So it was a real win-win and this project is scheduled to be awarded in September and we're excited for that. And we continue to work on all of these things with the Houston pilots. They're the ones that bring the ships in. We are working closely with them to make sure that we are addressing all the issues. We got we to gotta know what it is we need, what the channel dimensions need to be, so we can work with the Corps and the federal government to make sure we get our channel funded. And we're extremely important to have congressmen uh, champion our industry in this regard. Two of them 
what you'll hear from today. I'm anxious to hear from uh, Congressman Brian Babin, who sits on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and has uh, certainly been very supportive of the efforts that we're doing on the last word of bill. And Congressman Gene Green is always there to support, whether it's about funding or uh, in, in engaging on security issues, he's always there to support the betterment of the port. We're thankful to have their leadership in Congress and, uh, and they're true champions for what we're doing. The last question, and the th other thing that really keeps me up at night, is the transportation network. That's the land side of it. We have to have the water side, we have to have our facilities, we have to have the ability to get our goods to and from their destination uh, in our region, in, in our state, and, and, and throughout the nation. So just looking at our container, I use this as an example, just looking at our container terminals, for example, we're handling two million TEUs a year. We have the ability to grow this facility to handle five million TEUs per year. Just what if we were handling five million TEUs today? Think about what that impact to the transportation infrastructure might be. So we can't ignore the logistics chain. We need the whole logistics chain, the water, the port, the land side, which includes many things that we've been talking about. We have to take care of the future challenges of our transportation network to ensure our success. I was reading something the other day that I think was uh, applicable to kind of what's going on here today. It was an article written by a gentleman named Stephen Davies, and he was talking about some of the historical predictions that happened in the past that if this trend X continues, then the result will be a disaster. And I think when you talk about our highways and some of our transportation network, uh, it's been thought of in that way in our region. But in many cases with predictions like this, the, da the, the disaster doesn't really come to fruition because the fundamental problem with some of these gloomy predictions are that they fail to consider this one false assumption that things are gonna keep going on as they are. And they overlook the basic principle that people respond to incentives. So he told a story, it was a classic example that Mr. Davies wrote, and it was the great horse manure crisis of 1894. I don't know if you all ever heard of that, but it was an interesting parallel. Well over a century ago, the transportation network in London, and I think in many other cities, required 11,000 cabs that were all horse drawn. And there were thousands of buses that took 12 horses to pull each one of them. So over 50,000 horses were a part of their transportation system in London in the late 1800s. There was a problem, as you can imagine. Each one of these horses produced 20 or 30 pounds of manure every day, covering the streets, tracting flies, blowing everywhere. And it was a difficult one because the larger and richer the city became, the more horses they needed. See the parallel there? Houston, I can see, is that way. They had, to, they had to utilize more land for stables. They had to use more land to grow the hay, to feed the horses, and so it became, became a price challenge to continue this mode of transportation. Someone predicted in 1894 that in 50 years, the streets of London would be covered with 10 feet of manure. It seemed that the city was doomed as a result of its own success. Of course, civilization was not buried in manure, and the crisis vanished due to the incentives and the ingenuity and the forward thinking of people and horses were replaced by the automobile. So I see a parallel, not to the extent that was in 1894, but we have an issue. We have to take care of our transportation system. Some say that we are doomed in our region. And to this, I say horse something uh, because of the fact that in this room, 
we have the initiative, we have the ingenuity, we have the incentives to get out in front of this. And I think we are, but we have to focus on this together. We have to have unity in addressing the needs of the roads and the highways to keep our freight moving. Chad's group has routine meetings about these issues with our local mayors and the industry to talk about what our needs are. We have to keep doing that. We have to continue to highlight our needs to the legislature, legislators and those that fund these type of projects. We have to get creative. We have to do something more and not continue to do the same thing. Yes, we have to have alignment on hard assets and physical projects. Judge Emmett talks about the I-69 bypass, something that could swing around and, and not only uh, serve this port, but the port in uh, Freeport in Galveston. I hear they have ports there. And, uh, but we need to serve those. We need to do the things like we're considering the direct connectors into and out of Barber's Cut, things that keep our traffic moving. We have to encourage better utilization of the assets we have. We have to we have to use the roads and highways outside of the Monday through Friday eight to five traffic when all the peak loads are occurring. We see that at our port. We have assets, I'll, I'll mention, we have a $35 million gate that we built four or five years ago at Bayport. That gate is used about 25 or 30% of the clock hours of the week. We would much rather use that 24-7, and we will uh, sooner than you might think, rather than build more facilities to handle more trucks during the 8 to 5 hour. We need to encourage better utilizations of all modes of transportation, the railroads, even barge uh, using the intercoastal waterway to, tr uh, to move containers and, and, and other cargo. We have to do a lot of different things, but we also have to get out of the box and explore bold concepts such as one we've been thinking about, the freight shuttle. Some of you may not know much about this. This is a, a, a cartoon here, but I gotta tell you, it's now tangible. They have a prototype of this, uh, this network, and as you can see, elevated, uh, grade separated, electric, electromagnetic that can go somewhere, uh, reduce emissions, get trucks off the road. I don't know if it works, but we're committed to look forward and saying, hey, what are the economic benefits of this and is it really feasible for us to do? Now before all the truckers freak out about, hey, we're taking truckers, drive, we're, it, we're talking about taking it somewhere closer to where the cargo was and then a truck still gets to take it to wherever it needs to go. But, Hey, we're at the very beginning, but if we don't explore things like this, then our streets may get filled up with manure. So we have to get out of the box. These, this is an example of many things that we need to look at. So I've mentioned in the past, and I want to remind everybody again, that a few years ago, your port, our port, was deemed the most irreplaceable port in the country. And the reason for that, that these assets that were developed over the last hundred years, they're not going to pick up and go anywhere. So we have to protect this asset that's the economic engine for us in our region and for our state and make sure that it serves us well. So I'm going to close with that, but I want again, I want to thank Chad for allowing us to be here to give a perspective for the port. Uh, we think we're ready for bigger and better things to come. Thank you all for your engagement with me and being an instructor to us as we move forward in our journey together. So thank you very much for, for your time.